we see that taking away everybody's gun doesn't prevent them from getting in a car and killing people. Taking away cars doesn't prevent somebody from getting a knife and harming others. And so we really need to eliminate the, the sole problem. So what would you do if you were encountered with a threat? Say you hear gunshots out in the hallway at this moment, or worse yet, someone comes into this building with a firearm or a knife or some other type of a weapon with the sole intention of hurting as many of you as possible. What would you do? Would you run away? Would you hide? Would you try to fight off that individual? Honestly, I don't know what I would do in those situations, and I don't think any of us will really know until we're faced with that situation. And I pray none of us will, but in today's culture in America, this is becoming a daily occurrence, and as such, we have to prepare for those. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about those domestic terrorist attacks, specifically the active shooter incidences. First, we have to know what an active shooter is. And to get that knowledge, we have to take a step back and learn that not all events are shooter events. So active threat is a little more uh, appropriate definition for someone that's engaged in trying to harm individuals because it's not just guns that are a problem. We see time and time again, vehicles, knives, other weapons used to inflict mass destruction. So an active threat is basically any individual that is out to harm as many people as possible. They want a body count. They're trying to inflict damage. Typically, there's no pattern to the victim, so I don't have a hit list of who I want to take out. I'm just there to cause mass chaos. These events are typically very unpredictable, and they escalate very quickly, and they also resolve pretty quickly. And then finally, these are not individuals that could be negotiated with. Uh, this is not a person that is out to get money or uh, their record is sponged they have a sole intent to get a body count. So set, setting up time and wasting time trying to talk with these individuals is often not effective because they're already doing what they want and they want to continue to inflict that mayhem. And to know what an active shooter is or a mass shooting incident, we have to have some uh, backlog and figure out what exactly is a mass shooting event. And that becomes a little tricky because depending on who you're looking uh, or speaking with, the definition of what a mass sh shooter is can vary. So for example, the Congressional Research Service in 2013, which is a branch of the US government, defined an active or a mass shooter event as any event where four or more people are killed and that, that, that event occurs in a public venue and those victims are randomly selected. So by that definition, the United States last year, 2017, we had about 13 mass shooting events, which ends up being more than one a month. Now that's a pretty strict definition of what a mass shooting event is. If we look at kind of a more loose definition, the Gun Violence Archive, which is a non-for-profit organization that tracks gun statistics in the United States, would say that any mass shooting event is an event in which four or more people are shot or they're killed, and that event has to occur in a random public place. And so a lot more people would qualify or a lot more incidents would qualify under that definition. Um, it's mainly because we don't have to have a, the high death count, just people being shot is enough to classify it as a mass shooting in that category. Now under their definition, we are talking about 307 events last year. Um, and if we're looking at this year, we're talking more than one event a day of a mass shooting in the United States. And so we really have to understand the context behind that because it can skew our perceptions if I say there's 13 mass shooting events in the United States versus over 300 last year alone. The other thing we have to realize is that our culture has gotten to the point that we've come a little jaded to these events. We hear about them on news or on TV, and it's almost like it's another event, I'm just going to go about my day. And it's sad that we're at that point in our culture. Um, for example, has anyone here ever heard of the Townville Elementary School? I'll be honest, before starting this lecture, I really didn't. This was a school shooting that happened in 2016 in South Carolina. In this event, a 14-year-old killed his father at home, then proceeded to go to a school playground and randomly fire on teachers and children and uh, middle schoolers at this playground. During that event, three people were killed. Three were seriously wounded. And again, if we go back to our definitions, uh, that strict definition by the Congressional Research Committee would say that's not a mass shooting event because less than four people died. Yet Gun Archive would say that is a mass shooting event because more than three people were injured. And so this all leads us to what can we do? Uh, nursing is a huge profession, and as nurses we have a huge voice and an ability to impact change in a number of ways. The perception out there is nurses are in hospitals. That's where we practice, that's where we thrive. And so if we're not in a hospital, we're really not much good. And that can't be farther from the truth. In all actuality, nursing is more of an out-of-hospital experience and more of a community-based 
uh, profession than it is in hospital. More nurses right now work outside of a hospital than what we're in. And because of that, we have a huge role that we'll be talking about here in a little bit. And so it's important to remember that disaster cycle. So the disaster cycle kind of forms how we prepare for these events and prevent them. So with that cycle, we have mitigation, preparation, response, and then the recovery phase. So to start off with mitigation, Ezekiel 38.7 tells us that we need to be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be on guard for them. So during this mitigation phase, we're going to try to prevent or minimize the impact of these horrific accidents or these horrific uh, events. And during that mitigation phase, we need to be looking at all of those past events and saying, what did we do poorly then? What could we do better? And we need to start the preparation of how can we, one, prevent this from happening in our area, whether that's through mental health services, community education, increased security parameters, um, you know, gun control's out there in politics a lot. I'll leave you to decide whether or not that needs to happen. But all those options are part of the mitigation phase to try to prevent this event from even occurring in the first place. And heaven forbid it does occur to try to minimize the impact on that event. So if we're looking at some numbers and st some statistics about these active shooter events, uh, we know that these are occurring more and more frequently and they're becoming deadlier and deadlier. In fact, in the last decade, we have had the five most deadly active shooters or mass shooting events in our uh, history. And when I was originally working on this uh, presentation, I actually had the top 10 most deadly shootings. And in light of the most recent shooting at the Florida High School, uh, my slides are out of date because I can't even keep them up to date because this is happening so frequently. And so some of these you've heard of, you've heard of the Las Vegas shooting that occurred in October of last year where the individual opened up fire from his balcony onto a crowd of uh, concert goers. You've heard of the Orlando Pulse nightclub, the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Some of those you may not like Blacksburg, Virginia or Sutherland Springs, Texas. But all this just goes to show us how um, comfortable our society has come or how jaded we've become to these events. Uh, this some, something like this happened in Australia where a mass shooting hasn't happened in somewhere around three decades. Uh, it would be just absolutely horrific and would stop everything for that day. And that would be all that was talked about for weeks. Here in the United States, we hit on it a few days. We talk about it. We have all this rhetoric about what we need to do and what we're going to do better. And then we kind of go back into that cycle and we're just going to wait till the next one occurs. So looking at some more stats, the Federal Bureau of Investigation um, between 2000 and 2016 uh, did a culmination of these mass shooting events per their definition. And basically what they found is there was about 220 active shooter incidents in that 16 year period. Now what's a little concerning to me is the majority of those events, almost 75% of all mass shooting events happen at educational facilities and places of business. And uh, that's why we're seeing these school shootings and shootings at like Planned Parenthood and these other uh, businesses. And that's a little bit horrifying because students need to feel safe where they go to school. You guys deserve the right to go to school in a safe environment and you need to feel safe or else what's the point in trying to learn if you don't even feel like you can learn safely. And if we also look at those numbers in 2000, there was one mass shooting. If we look at 2016 by FBI statistics, we we're at 20 and every year it tends to climb exponentially and we really haven't dropped at all. We're just kind of towing that line of around 20. And again, this just goes to show us that we are not fixing the problem. There is a problem that has to be fixed and it requires collaboration between multiple professions, uh, honest, open conversations, and a desire to actually have a change. So again, we need to know a little bit about those shooters and what makes them tick and what we need to do to prevent those shootings during that mitigation phase. So if we're looking at some uh, facts about shooters, typically they are often a single gunman. And when I say gunman, I mean male. Uh, more often than not, it is a male perpetrator, but more often than not, it's only one person that's carrying these. Statistically, small firearms are, are used more commonly in those active shooter events. Um, and again, that just goes with the principle that we need to educate ourselves uh, because depending on which news outlet you're looking at, you may think that every shooting event has a semi-automatic assault rifle with a bump stock. And while that does happen, if we're looking at facts, more often than not, it's with a small firearm. Typically, those are also purchased legally. So these are individuals that legally went about uh, the purchase of that handgun and that handgun is licensed and or registered with the government. 
Typically, those shooters do have some history of mental illness, whether that's diagnosed or undiagnosed. Uh, at some point in time, we learned that there was some mental health issues or warning signs that were overlooked. And more often than not, these events end in suicide of the shooter. And that's either they end their lives themselves or they confront police with the intention of having the police kill them. Additionally, it's not like most shooters get up much one morning and decide today's the day I'm going to cause mass homicide. Uh, this is not a spur of the moment decision in most cases. Typically, these attackers are very well versed in what they want to do. They make plans days, weeks, months in advance, and they have backup plans to their plans. This is also something where they often talk about those plans. Uh, they don't keep these plans a secret. They get on social forums. They speak with friends or family members. Um, and whether people think they're joking or whether worst case scenario, they actually support that event, people know about it. And they're just not being reported to the right authorities or there's so many reports that are occurring that authorities can't investigate every single allegation. Uh, these attackers typically have more than one target. So they have, like I said, a backup plan should site A not be efficient because school's closed for the day, I have site B that I could go to. And if we're talking school shootings, typically the first people to respond to that shooter are the educators, the staff trying to protect the students. And so you may have seen or hear a, a culture shift on news where people are urging educators and staff members, don't engage these shooters, uh, hide, get away from them, try to protect yourselves. And as you all know, uh, especially here, we care very much about you guys and we would happily lay our lives on the line for you. And so me personally, I just don't know if somebody telling me not to do that is gonna be enough to prevent me from going after that individual or trying to block students from that gunfire. And we just saw that with the uh, Florida event the other day where an educator was killed trying to protect uh, a few female students. So once that event occurs, it occurs very rapidly and escalates very rapidly. Typically on average, about every 15 seconds, somebody is shot with most events ending in 12 minutes or less, about 37% end in less than five minutes. And that is often before law enforcement officials even get to the scene. Uh, so they hear that police are coming or they feel like I've carried out as much mayhem as I have and they end the event by taking their own life or escaping the area. And 93% of the time, those events are before healthcare providers get to them, before uh, EMS, fire, or whatever healthcare individuals are on scene get to those victims. So we're already fighting an uphill battle when it comes to uh, the care of those victims because they're happening so quickly. So that's our mitigation. Now we need to move into preparation. And Benjamin Franklin once told us, by failing to, pre uh, failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And that's why it's so important that we become prepared. And I think this is one area where nursing really shines and we can come to the rescue. Big thing is education. We need to educate ourselves. We need to educate community members. We need to educate legislatures uh, or uh, the legal system, you know, whether that's our house representatives or our state senators or uh, congressmen or women, they need to know uh, the facts behind these events. We need to help with the improved access to mental health care services. Uh, there is a huge deficit in our mental health care in this nation. And you'll see as you go into practice that a number of your patients that you're going to encounter have some sort of mental health diagnosis or a mental health problem that they need help with. Uh, local, state, and federal regulation is another huge area. Uh, the nursing profession is one of the largest professional bodies in the United States. That means we have a huge voice. We have a lot of backing, a lot of support, and uh, we have a lot of money that goes towards lobbying. And through using those collaborative efforts, we can really help to influence legislation um, and culture change in a positive way. At a more local level, emergency management planning is another area where we can have a huge impact. So at the very least, we should be working with our schools, our fire departments, our police departments, our hospitals, businesses, to help them to prepare for these events and make those plans. And then we need to carry out those plans through disaster exercises. Myself, I've been a part of several different active shooter uh, events and exercises where multiple uh, professions come together to try to prepare for those events. And every time we learn something, and every time somebody that hasn't been there walks away thinking, wow, I really didn't think of it that way, or I really never would have understood what it was like to be surrounded by gunfire until I was here and you were actually shooting a gun close to me. And it can really be a life altering and eye opening experience. So if we uh, do that preparation, that preparation phase is going to help us to prepare to how exactly we react should the event occur. And then we move into our response phase, which is, okay, it's happening. What do I do to try to 
uh, minimize the effects of that event, meaning how do I save the largest number of people possible? And hopefully this day never comes for any of us, but it may. And Nahum 1.7 says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. And I just want to pause here and just kind of say, uh, I know that there's a lot of rhetoric and a lot of debate that goes on about how this could be achieved. And no matter where you stand on uh, mental health services or the gun culture or um, the enabling of certain populations, I think it's important to remember this is not really a gun problem. This is not really a legislative problem. This is a heart problem. There is something wrong with the heart of those people that carry these out. They are missing the love of Christ. They really have something that's missing from their lives that requires them or makes them feel compelled to go to this extreme. And really, I think the only way we're ever going to solve this is by showing love to those individuals and by helping them to feel accepted and helping them to overcome whatever depression or anxiety or fear or struggle they're dealing with. Um, because we see that taking away everybody's gun doesn't prevent them from getting a car and killing people. Taking away cars doesn't prevent somebody from getting a knife and harming others. And so we really need to eliminate the, the sole problem. So this event occurs, what do we do? Well, the best thing to do is be aware of the environment so we know how to safely get out of the area and also so we can recognize a threat when it occurs. You've all been at the airport where they say report suspicious activity if you see this bag laying there. Same thing in any environment that you're in. If you see something suspicious or something that seems out of place, react to that, notify somebody. Uh, worst case scenario, or best case scenario, it's a misconception or you misunderstood and no harm, no foul. Worst case scenario, you didn't report something and people die because of it. If you are encountering an active shooter or there is an active threat in the area, the best thing to do is evacuate if it's safe to do so. Um, so if shooting is happening across campus, get away from the shooting. Now that's not always possible. If someone is shooting outside of the classroom or shooting outside of our dorm or we're at Meyer and somebody's shooting down the, the aisleway, Running out may not be the best idea because then we're putting ourselves in danger. So in those situations, it's best to hide, to go into an area where you can lock a door, turn off the lights, silence cell phones, and really pretend that you're not even there. Uh, because as we know, these events are rapidly escalating. People that are carrying out these events want the high body count. So they're looking for easy targets. If they go to the classroom and see the doors locked and it doesn't look like anybody's in there, they don't have the time or the desire to try to break in that door or to try to search that classroom. They're going to simply go on to the next area and look for the next easy target. And then finally, if you are encountered by that individual and you can't hide, they've made eye contact, that's when you fight. And the best thing to do is to do anything that gives you an advantage. Scream, yell, act like a crazy person, uh, make yourself look foolish, because if you give them a moment to pause, that moment where they kind of think, what are they doing? Is the moment between life and death that you can actually get the upper hand. So when these events occur, that's when we're gonna implement all those things we've learned from our mitigation and preparation phase. Uh, we're gonna put our emergency action plans in place. We're gonna notify local law, police, hospitals. We're going to activate our blood banks. We're going to get um, basically everything that we put into place in place at that time. And then we also need to be aware that media is going to be uh, an issue. And so we need to have a way of communicating with media, a person that's going to be in charge of that. We have to have a way to secure the area and to also secure areas where patients are coming and going from. So if they're bringing patients to say our ER, we need to have security in place. So should another event break out, we have means to protect ourselves. And then we have to be aware that there's going to be multiple outside resources that we have to pull into these events because these are not events that one person or one hospital or one police agency or one EMS agency can handle alone. And so we have to be able to branch outside of our normal comfort zone and get a helping hand from our brothers and sisters across county lines, across state lines, and even up to the federal level if needed. So as part of that mitigation phase and that recovery phase, we're always looking at what went wrong, what could have gone better. And one thing that came out of the Sandy Hook school shooting was the Hartford Consensus. And basically this was a report that was developed that said, as healthcare individuals, we could do X, Y, and Z to help to minimize the impact of these events and help to save lives. And that was the THREAT acronym. So that stands for threat suppression, meaning law enforcement immediately engaging that shooter and stopping the shooting. Hemorrhage control, because we know that most of these victims are going to bleed out within a few minutes, if not seconds after the event. So we have to control that bleeding quickly. We have to have rapid extrication of those victims to a safe area where they can get more thorough 
and purposeful care. We have to have assessment by highly qualified healthcare professionals uh, that are well versed in trauma and disaster situations. And then we have to have rapid transportation to a definitive care facility. Often these victims of trauma are going to need some type of surgical services and they need to be in a facility where they can have a skilled surgeon that can take care of these injuries. Another thing to keep in mind, we've talked about triage and how we need to triage victims appropriately and quickly and get them to the right place at the right time. Well, these mass shooting events give triage a little bit of a unique twist in the fact that until the area is completely cleared by police, uh, these scenes are often very volatile and we don't often know if there is one shooter or seven shooters. So until that scene's cleared, everyone is a potential threat. Every one of the patients you encounter, every one of the victims you encounter may end up being a threat. Uh, you don't know for certain that they were not one of the shooters or a shooter. And so you have to address every single patient as if they're a possible threat and protect yourselves. And then with our rapid treatment and uh, assessment and those safer areas, once they get evacuated, we need to remember the acronym MARCH because this will also help us to prevent deaths. So MARCH stands for massive hemorrhage because again, we know that these victims bleed out very quickly. And so we have to be able to control the bleeding. One way we can do that is with tourniquet application. Um, tourniquet application is a huge lifesaver uh, that is often underthought of with these bleeding situations. And tourniquets are something that is very simple to use. Um, they can be something as simple as a necktie that you take off and tie wrap uh, very tightly around an extremity to stop the bleeding. Has anybody ever heard the whole take off your belt and use that as a tourniquet? A Little bit of a misnomer, belts are actually very poor tourniquets because belts are pretty stiff. And so the stiffness of that belt and the fact that they're meant to go around a larger waist means that it's hard to get enough pressure on an arm or say a leg in order to stop or tampon that blood off. And so a, a belt's probably not the first idea that you should go to, but certainly ties, uh, handkerchiefs, scarves, shirts, uh, pieces of clothing, anything that has some pliability that you can wrap it and then tighten it. And getting a simple stick and wrapping that around the cloth and turning it until blood stops is enough for a tourniquet. We have to protect the airway. We know that airway is important. Uh, this is one of those situations where we don't do the normal airway breathing circulation, ABC, that you teach in all, or you've learned in all your other classes. Here it's more about the bleeding, so that's why we throw that first. But airway is still important, so those patients need to have their airway secured, um, suctioned out, advanced uh, endotracheal tube placement, things of that nature to prevent any aspiration or damage to the airway. Respiratory rate needs to be supported, uh, either through bag valves, bag valve mask ventilation or airway opening. And then we also need to help support the circulatory system. And so that may be through fluid administration, maybe through blood administration or some type of um, vasoconstrictor or other medication to try to improve, improve that cardiac output. And then finally, as part, of that, as part of that march is the hypothermia head injury uh, portion of that. So we have to prevent the patients from getting hypothermic, especially as we're in entering or are in colder weather months, uh, it's important to keep those victims warm because we know that as victims get colder and colder, the uh, possibility of shock increases. So we have to prevent hypothermia by warming patients. And then we also need to assess for and stabilize and treat any potential head injuries that the victim may have. We have to know what injuries we're dealing with because there's a lot of potential injuries that come from these uh, mass shooting events. Typically, we all think of the gunshots, which is true, that is the most common injury, but we also have other injuries. Uh, often, some sort of explosive device is used in these events, and so we need to be uh, on the lookout for burn injuries, blast injuries, uh, those type of things that will go along with an explosive. We also have to be on the lookout for fall and trip injuries. People are trying to escape this event in a very rapid manner, and it's very easy to become tangled up with one another and to trip and fall, or to jump out of a window to try to get away from the event and cause a fracture or other injury. And we also know trampling injuries are common occurrences in events as people are trying to get away. It causes a stampede effect where we're actually uh, stumbling over one another and stepping on individuals. And again, that's another area where we need to be aware of, and we need to have supplies ready to treat that. So it's not just enough to have IV and blood supplies. We also have to have supplies for fracture care and wound management. And then finally, we enter into our recovery phase. Um, so the recovery phase is that last area of the disaster cycle. During this phase, we're trying to get some sort of normalcy back. And this is going to be a ongoing process. There's no set time frame for this. It could be days, weeks, months, um, and for some people, it may last a lifetime, especially if they've lost a loved one in these events. 
And so Isaiah 9, 10 tells us the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars up in their place. And so we can rebuild. Certainly we cannot get things back to the way they were, but we can get things back to as close as they were, and we can improve upon those uh, through hard work and collaboration with one another. And so one thing we need to address in these areas are mental health care, uh, not just for the, the perpetrator of the crime, but also all those that were involved in those events. As you watch these events on the news, you can see the pain and suffering that people are experiencing as they go through those events. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a very real problem for many people that live through these events, and we need to be ready to prepare them for that. As healthcare professionals, we need to go through a critical stress incident debriefing, or CSID. Uh, this is a time where we can come together as a team of healthcare and law enforcement officials, and we can say, how we're feeling. We can decompress. Um, I've been a part of several of these. They're never easy to do. No one wants to talk about the fear, the anxiety, the frustration you feel, especially in a room full of people where you feel vulnerable. But that's really where we start to make strives towards uh, self-improvement. The worst thing we can do is to turn to isolation or turn to alcohol or drugs or some other risky behavior in order to try to fill that void of the pain that we're feeling. And so we need to reach out to one another and work with one another as a team. And critical uh, incident stress debriefing is a great way to do that. Long-term rehabilitation, uh, we know these victims, depending on the injuries, have a tough road ahead of them. So we need to educate and prepare them early on that this may not be something as simple as they're gonna go home tomorrow from these events. Uh, they may have months or even years of physical rehabilitation in order to get back to where they were, if they ever get back to that point. We need to rebuild damaged structures. Uh, bullets cause a lot of devastation, not only to the human body, but also to the environment uh, around those events. So there's gonna be a rebuilding phase. And then we also need to take time to look at everything that happened, uh, analyze the situation, analyze what we did right, what we did wrong, and what we can do uh, to prevent that from happening in the future. Because really it's only through those events uh, that we can learn how to prevent them from happening again. And if we learn from our past mistakes, we can prevent them from happening again. But it's not enough just simply to say that's a terrible event. We really need to do something. Action has to be taken in order to grow. And again, this is where we can come in as nurses because we can stay on top of things and force that action. And through that, you guys can change the world.